I know you've heard it a lot of times already, but Merry Christmas. How many enjoyed uh, being led by the worship team earlier in those amazing <laughs> hymns? Remind us of, of what God has done and is doing. I'm so glad that you're here. We're in Matthew, the first chapter. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. It was actually during covid lockdown that I discovered that YouTube had more uses than just finding cute videos or videos how to, about how to do things. Their whole channels devoted to the pursuit of things that people are quite passionate about. And one of the things I noticed is there's an inordinate number of people on YouTube that own drones. And they just feel the need to give us a view from 200 feet up. It's interesting because a couple of hundred feet higher, things can look quite a bit different. It expands your perspective and your perception of something. You see a bigger, wider, fuller picture. Sometimes it is a lot more beautiful, sometimes very dramatic. When I was thinking about that, I was wondering what would be a larger, higher, wider view of the Christmas story? What did it look like from heaven's perspective? And I think it looked quite different than the cute angels, the cuddly sheep, the youthful shepherds, and the regal magis that cover our Christmas cards that we send this time of year. Our version of the Christmas story is peaceful, it's relaxing, and it's rated G. What if from heaven's perspective, this story was different? What if it was daring? What if it was dangerous? Matthew's gospel actually begins with a surprise. We're inserted into a relational crisis. An engagement is about to be called off. There's a lot of relational pain, certainly disappointment, a sense of betrayal. You can almost see the pain on Joseph's face. And Mary? Well, all she had done is say yes to God, and now her world was falling apart. What would she, would she have to raise this child on her own? Oh, but this is not really higher elevation, is it? It's just a close-up of the people who are involved. From heaven's perspective, this was more than just the birth of one more poor person in the ancient world. This was a rescue mission. And the people whose roles we reenact in Christmas plays were not always aware of all that was happening or going on in their lives. Sometimes we actually see rescue attempts on television and in the news. And it captures our attention as sometimes those stories are retold in books and in movies. And they're very dramatic. We get caught up in the drama of all of it. Someone is lost. Someone is in danger. Someone is about to perish. And there's someone else who's actually looking for them. They want to rescue them. They want to resuscitate them. They want to recover. The question always is, will they get there in time? Will their plan work? 
And there's a sense that time is running out and in that strength can be failing and hope can be fading. There's this great passage in Galatians, the fourth chapter, that says this, when the right time came, just the right time, God sent his son born of a woman. The right time, the window of opportunity in the arc of human history was exactly then. God was going to rescue us. How? How would he do it? What would he say? How would he go about it? The way he does it is not like we see a lot of things done today. When we're trying to make a difference or raise some money, we get a lot of people in the room. Looks like an award show. People stand in front, lots of applause, maybe some checks. No, not this. This is a secret mission. And if the wrong people find out about it, real lives will be threatened and maybe lost. So on a very dark night with only a few team members, the green light is given and the mission commences. And that starts with a poor couple who's huddled together in an animal shelter. It includes some distant travelers who have some secret mechanism by which they are guided to their destination. Some shepherds who bring encouragement to a couple to remind them that they're not crazy that they're actually on mission, and some magi who will, need re who will give needed resources when they have to make a secret escape in the middle of the night in order to protect the life of the child. The wider view also shows us something else. There's some messages that have been sent throughout time to encourage people through people like David and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah. And their words were intended to encourage people to hold on because help was on the way. It's, it's amazing how often when we know help is coming, we find a little more strength or a little more courage. The Old Testament was full of those kinds of promises that God was not going to abandon us in a dark and a broken world. A plan was being formed and promises were going to be kept. And so the arriving king, well, you can imagine his life might be in jeopardy. So how will he come in? Will he be surrounded by military or by warriors or by some form of secret service? There doesn't seem to be anything that calls attention to himself at all. This new king comes as a newborn baby. In an animal shelter, a young woman goes into labor and her cries cease when his cries begin. A baby born is born into our world. And he is the king that will rescue all of us. His name, the angel told him, what Joseph, what to name him, Jesus. It literally means the Lord saves or the Lord rescues. The nation of Israel understood what it was like to need rescue. There have been three great oppressions in their national history. Once they had been taken and enslaved by the Egyptians. Once they had been relocated by the Babylonians, and now they were being occupied by the Romans. And Israel very much wanted to be rescued. They wanted a savior. They wanted to be rescued from this Roman occupation. Occupation. They saw their primary problem as a political one. Get the Romans out, everything would be better. And what did the angel say? Give him the name Jesus. God will rescue, for he will save his people from their sins. Wait, you don't understand God. We don't need to be saved from our sins. We need to be saved from those sinners. And that's the primary and biggest reason why we don't receive and accept the Savior. From our perspective, our sins is never the biggest problem. It's not what we really need to be rescued from. We would prefer that God come in as a conquering warrior king. And he could have done that. He could have laid waste to all of the military armies that would stand against him or any governmental structure that would rise up opposed to him. It could be like a scene out of the Lord of the Rings movie where the ground just swallows up everyone who stands against him. So before you really cheer that model on, how sure are you of the ground on which you are standing? 
Are you sure that that ground is going to hold you up when righteousness wipes away everything else? It's not how he came. God did not send his son to rescue us by conquering us. He sent his son to rescue us by winning us. And there's the difference. He comes not incognito to hide among us, but incarnate to reveal himself to us. And what does he want your first impression of this rescuing king to be? A baby. Whose heart does not melt at the sight of a newborn baby? Whose heart is not stirred with the miracle of life? He came to save us from our sins. Why is that? Because it is our sins that actually separate us from God. It's our sins that blind us to his presence around us and his purpose for us. It's our sins that keep us from seeing his image in everyone else's face that we come in contact with. We don't need to be saved from those people and that situation. We need to be saved from our sins. So, on that night in Bethlehem, a virgin gave birth to a baby boy. I'll have the worship team come back out. His name? Jesus. Happy. Healthy. Hungry. Holy. I know a virgin birth is really difficult to believe in. But I think it's important to the story. You see, this life of a rescue newborn king did not come into our world by what someone else accomplished. Mary was recruited by an angel to see if she was interested in being part of God's rescue plan. The first question she asked is, how would this be possible? And the angel said, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that which is conceived in you, we call the Son of God. And then it happens. It's, it's the critical moment in any drama. In that moment, she utters the words that changes the course of her life and ours. May it be to me, as you have said. I think in a way we all need a birth like that inside of us. And it doesn't come from the rules that we keep or the, the enlightenment that we accomplish. It's not born out of our efforts, our strength, our wisdom, or our knowledge. It's an invitation from heaven. And while we wonder how, the answer is always the same. The Holy Spirit comes upon us. The power of God overshadows us. And something is conceived within us. And that is life. We all need a spiritual birth. We all need life. And just like that, that's how it grows within us. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we do get anxious and annoyed. We feel threatened by so many things in our world. And rightly so. There's much that can hurt and harm us. And to be honest, we get a little frustrated by your methods because we would prefer you came in swinging swords and knocking down doors, taking names. But instead, you whisper invitations. You give us the opportunity. And if we're willing tonight to say the words to you, may it be to me, as you have said, <laughs> right then, right then, new life is conceived in us. I ask that you would make it that true for each and every one of us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. In case you're wondering, the shortness of that message is my Christmas gift to you. <laughs>
before we go to the next part of the service, it actually requires a little bit of a service announcement. And the, the reason is, is that we, we don't want anything to happen here that would cause harm to anyone. So you can all stand. And, and underneath your seat is a candle and a candle holder. We ask that you pull that out. And in just a moment, some people are going to be start lighting some candles down the sides of the aisles. And you can pass that light to someone else. So this is what we recommend. If your candle is lit, hold it straight. If your candle's not lit, you can move it sideways to get to have it lit. But if you tip it sideways once it's lit, then some hot wax could come out and we don't want anybody to get some hot wax on them in the service today. That, that's not what we want their memory of this service to be. And then when we get to the end of our service, to the end of our Christmas carol singing, we'll also give you some instructions on how to put those out. We actually would ask you not to take off your mask and blow on them for obvious reasons, right? Let's lift our voice in singing praise to the King. <laughs> 